Puck to the Trains. It's time for Renegades of Puck TV. Welcome to the bunker. Welcome to the essence of No Half Steppin'. I'm your host and Captain Crazy Charlie Sonia. And before we get started on the No Half Steppin' hockey coverage, let me direct you to renegadesofpuck.com. Once you go to our home website, you'll learn everything you need to know about the Renegades of Puck. And once you click on that merchandise link, you will go immediately to the classic logo t shirt that you see me wearing right here in the bunker this evening. Or you can find the Pride logo t shirt or any of our special event t-shirts and plenty of other gimmicks socks throw pillows wall art we have over 55 gimmicks in our online store for you renegades of puck to purchase we've sold out so that you can buy in so we'd appreciate if you would pick up some merchandise from the renegades of puck social media throughout our first season is of critical importance for you to help us build the recruiting has been going great we have over 130 subscribers now to our youtube channel and we continue adding renegades all the time we have room for all of them so please continue passing those links around. Share them on your Facebook feeds. That would help us out tremendously. Also, give us a like on Facebook. Or if you would prefer Twitter as your method of sharing on social media, then we certainly would appreciate that. Give us a like, give us a retweet, and certainly interact with the Renegades of Puck right there on Twitter. You can also find us on Instagram and very, very soon, you'll be finding us on a brand new audio platform. On the next episode, I'll be making an announcement where you can find the audio show moving forward. So SoundCloud is no longer a part of the Renegades of Puck operation moving forward. Our behind the scenes live stream happens on Twitch and we're building a really fun community right there. We do a whole lot of behind the scenes work and bonus footage there. We do plug to plug broadcast. You get to see everything of how an episode of Renegades of Puck TV is made from plugging in the lights and setting up the equipment to recording the full episode and even breaking down the studio. It's not pretty. It's real broadcasting, and it's happening over on Twitch. If there are any F-bombs, second takes, or mistakes, that's where you're going to find them. You're also going to get the information first. Just another way that you can consume the essence of no half stepping. so we would appreciate your support in any of those ways. You can become a partner of the Renegades of Puck by going to Venmo and searching Renegades of Puck, or just scanning the QR code that's currently on your screen. Every dollar donated helps the Renegades of Puck significantly. We are an independent operation, and we are built by Renegades for Renegades. So every time you send us a little bit of money, we reinvest it right here into the bunker or into our operations. The summer of no half stepping is very ambitious, so I will definitely be needing some assistance in those areas. So thank you so much. Stick taps love and respect to each and every one of you who have already become a partner by donating to the Renegades of Puck. Now, listen, I know you're here for the no half step in hockey coverage, so let's get to it. Operation number 645 for the Renegades of Puck. That's right, show number 645. And on this date in hockey history, the Nashville Purs regular season has come to its conclusion. After 82 games played, the Nashville Purs finish in fifth place in the Central Division, a record of 45, 30, and 7. 97 points had them finish just one point behind the Dallas Stars for fourth place. Therefore, the Nashville Purs finish as the second wild card team in the Western Conference playoff bracket. The Central Division gets five teams into the playoff bracket. We'll go over those here in just a moment, but let's talk about the Nashville Purs season first. On home ice, the Nashville Purs went 25-14 and two this season. On the road, they went 20-16 and five. They scored 266 goals for, and they gave up 252 goals against. That is a goal differential of plus 14. And in a season where the Nashville Purs were anticipated to finish outside the playoff picture, they overcame those odds and they made the playoffs they are in fact the eight seed or the wild card two in the western conference playoff bracket but the central division gets a total of five teams in and it did remain highly competitive up until the final minutes of this regular season as we discussed at the very beginning of the season if you'd like to go back and review the work every single episode is right there on youtube you can check it out we discussed that we didn't know what this team was going to be, and it may take until the very final minutes of the final game of the regular season before the Nashville Predators knew exactly what this season was going to be, and that's exactly what ended up happening. Now the Nashville Predators will face off against the Central Division division-winning Colorado Avalanche 
while the Minnesota Wild and the St. Louis Blues will face off against each other, the Dallas Stars will move into the Pacific Division bracket as Wild Card 1 to take on the Calgary Flames. Just to round out the Central Division, because we're wrapping up the season, you also had Winnipeg finish in 6th, Chicago finish in 7th, and the Arizona Coyotes finish in 8th place in the Central Division. Now, for the Nashville Predators, of course, you want to know when the playoff schedule is, so let me tell you that, but... Mostly, we're going to focus on looking back on the season at this point, and then on the next episode, we're going to focus on moving forward and previewing Game 1 and the entire playoff bracket. So for the Nashville Purs, they will take on the Colorado Avalanche. Game 1 will take place Tuesday night in Colorado, 8.30 on the puck drop. That's Central Time. Thursday will be Game 2, again, 8.30 Central Time on the puck drop. Saturday will be Game 3 in Nashville, 3.30 Central Time on the puck drop. Monday night, 8.30 Central Time at Bridgestone Arena for Game 4. And then, of course, Game 5, if necessary, in Colorado. Game 6, if necessary, at Nashville. And Game 7, if necessary, back in Colorado. Of course, this is going to be a highly impressive matchup between these two teams, and we just had a good time talking about these two teams just on the last episode. So, for the moment, we are going to go ahead and just talk about the Nashville Predators. When it comes to what they accomplished this season statistically, the Nashville Predators finished 12th in the NHL in goals for 3.20 in goals against. 3.05 given up this season was 17th in the NHL. Shots for 29.7. They didn't have the quality nor the quantity at any point in time this season. We're in the lower third of the statistics all season long. 24th in the league is where they finished. Shots against 32.3 given up per game. 20th in the NHL. The Nashville Predators power play far exceeded the Kevin McCarthy era and finished sixth overall in the NHL. 63 conversions on 258 power play opportunities or 24.4%. On the penalty kill, the Preds finished 18th in the NHL, giving up 59 power play goals against but killing off 79.2% of the power plays against them this year. Now, injuries at the end of the season are certainly an issue for the Nashville Purs moving forward. Their starting netminder, UC Soros, is still estimated to be out for at least a couple of more weeks with a high ankle sprain. Jeremy Luzon was on the final road trip of the regular season and did take participation in the morning skate, but we do not know if he is eligible to start in Game 1 on Tuesday for the Nashville Predators. When it comes to the regular season statistics for the Nashville Predators, Roman Yossi led the team in scoring virtually all season long and put up a historic season for not only a Nashville Predators player, but something we have not seen in well over 30 years in the NHL. A defenseman finishing the season with 96 points, 23 goals, 73 assists, simply incredible. He broke every single record that the Nashville Predators had as far as points in a regular season and smashed it incredibly almost made the run right there to 100. Duchesne, 43 goals, ends up being your new franchise record for a single season at 43 assists, that for 86 points. So he also surpasses Paul Correa's former 85-point mark, which was the franchise leader going into this season. So two Nashville Predators break the single-season franchise record for points. Two Nashville Predators also break the single-season goal record for scoring, and Philip Forsberg is the other with 42 goals, 42 assists also for him, 84 points overall. Mikhail Granlund had a career year with 11 goals and 53 assists for 64 points. Ryan Johansson, 26 goals and 37 assists for 63 points. And Tanner Janot, 24 goals and 17 assists for 41 points, went into a bit of a scoring drought towards the end of the season, maybe hitting a little bit of that rookie wall, even though he is an older player for consideration for the Calder Trophy. He is still a rookie and going into the amount of games played and the way he goes about no half stepping perhaps Tanner Janot was just a little bit tired down the stretch of the season he still finishes with a very respectable 24 goals on the season and 41 points overall and I cannot wait to see what he accomplishes in this postseason the Nashville Predators are going to have to go with big save Dave Riddick going into the first round of the playoffs in the regular season numbers are not very good 6-3 and 4 886 save percentage 3.57 3.57 goals against average, but we saw in the tryout scenarios in the last two games of the regular season after UC Saros's injury, Big Save Dave was competing for his job, competing for his career, while we saw Connor Ingram 
getting flustered, frustrated, and struggle. But we are going to talk about that coming up here in just a minute. And we'll also have Mostradamus review his performance so that you can be as informed as possible before we get to game one of the Western Conference playoffs for the Nashville Predators and the Colorado Avalanche. So that has you set up. That's the recap and the review of the Nashville Predators regular season. They were expected to finish outside the playoff picture, and they finished inside the playoff picture. Now anything can happen moving forward. Did they get the opponent that they supposedly wanted to handpick in the Calgary Flames? No, they did not. And did they have an epic collapse? You're about to hear all about it against the Arizona Coyotes to wrap up the season. Frankly, one of the most pathetic regular season performances that I've seen for the Nashville Predators. And that's saying something. We'll get into that, though, coming up here in just a moment as we hit the Rebirth Sports full game recap. As a matter of fact, why even wait? Let's get right into it. It's time for the Rebirth Sports full game recap. Rebirth Sports. You can find them at RebirthSports.com or on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I can tell you right now, running gates of puck. While the regular season may be coming towards its conclusion, our partnership with Rebirth Sports is just starting to get heated up. Renegade couriers have been dispatched across the landscape yet again with another series of great jerseys to end up in the hands of Renegades of Puck everywhere. So the Rebirth Sports crew does such an incredible job that I really think you should reach out to them, give them some stick taps, give them some love, and give them some respect for what they do. They're not just jersey makers, they're hockey tailors. They can make your vision become a reality as they have done for the Renegades of Puck and so many other operations and organizations that I have been lucky to be associated with. The Mighty Drunks, the Wish Cup, other charity events, the U.S. Pond Hockey Championships on Lake Nokomis. Wherever I go, wherever I skate, everyone wants to know where I got those threads. It's Rebirth Sports. So check them out, rebirthsports.com. Let's go back and recap the final game of the regular season for the Nashville Predators. It took place on April the 29th of the year 2022 when the Nashville Predators were wrapping up the regular season in Arizona versus the Coyotes who were wrapping up their franchise history with their NHL-sized home arena before downsizing into a much smaller 5,000-seat rank next year. After all, the NHL can get $650 million for an expansion fee, so why in the world would they shut down the Arizona Coyotes and move them somewhere for free? Sometimes you got to think about how much money the NHL makes in scenarios like this. If Quebec or Kansas City or perhaps Houston is willing to pay $650 million, why in the hell would you be interested in moving the Coyotes for absolutely nothing? It's just some other commentary for another season. John Hines deploys his lines in the following way on the last night of the season. Cutting Johansson and Tomasino, Forsberg, Granlin and Duchesne, Trennan, Sissons and Janot, Tolvanen, McCarron and Luff, Yossi and Fabro, Davies and Carrier, Borbietsky and Benning. Connor Ingram gets his tryout and opportunity to start for the Nashville Predators. We are 25 seconds into the first period, and Colton Sissons has his seventh goal of the season. It was Roman Yossi's long bomb pass that springs Sissons for the wrist shot to the top corner, giving the Preds a one to nothing lead in Arizona and an amazing start to the game because at 206 is Johansson's 26th goal of the season. He puts the shoulder check in the corner to dislodge the defender, takes the puck, walks the goal line, steps out and delivers the jam, giving the Preds a 2 to nothing lead. But before I could even make a notation on it, at 251, Tolvanen's 11th goal of the season gives the National Purse a 3 to nothing lead. Very similar to what Johansson just did, but he just made a little bit of a different path on the arc. He takes the puck from the corner and he walks it out into the slot, steps out and scores Another goal, three shots, four, three goals on four shots for the Nashville Predators, while Arizona has yet to get a shot on goal in this game. At 5.09, we see Connor Ingram get his first opportunity to touch the puck, a save on Kessel, first shot on goal for the Arizona Coyotes. At 6.57, we see Granlin scoring his 11th goal of the season. At this point, with it being 4 to nothing in favor of the Nashville Predators in under seven minutes, Vimelka is out of this game, and Satiri is in. Vimelka goes two of six and gives up four goals against. Now, things start to turn in favor of the Arizona Coyotes in 13-21 as O'Brien gets his third goal of the season. It was deflected and it was bouncing, but it found its way through Ingram and into the back of the net. 18-41, Ingram comes over the big seven on Carcone with a pad kick out, and that takes us to the end of the first period with the Nashville Predators out shooting the Arizona Coyotes 10-6 and holding a 4-1 lead. The second period starts off with not a lot of action, some low event hockey and very, very few shots towards the net. So we go to 6-04 the second period when Sateri comes up with a save 
save on Janot at 9.17 in the second period. Soderstrom's off the box. Two minutes for slashing. Soteri come up with a huge save on Tomasino. 14.25 of the second period. That's when we find Boyd scoring his 17th goal of the season. It was another deflection on another long shot. Arizona's second goal of the game. Now the National Purs leading 4-2, but at 18.24 of the second period, McBain's second goal of the season. Some rebound jam pushes the puck through Ingram and into the net. The National Purs now hold a 4-3 to three lead in this game, and things are starting to get quite a bit more tense out there, and it would get even more tense in 1946 when Mikhail Granlin goes off to the box, two minutes for interference, so the big carryover of 146 into the third period, but at the end of the second period, the National Purs are out shooting the Arizona Coyotes 20-15. to 15. On that 146 carryover in the third period in the clean sheet, Connor Ring would have to come up with a couple of different saves, but at 151 after the power play is over, Carcone's fourth goal of the season is a one-timer from the right circle, and it absolutely blows right by Ingram into the back of the net, tying this game up at four uh, piece at 258 of the third period. Matt Duchesne is off to box four minutes for high sticking, and I know Duchesne wanted to go into the half wall there, and he wanted to deliver some contact, but why in the world was his stick straight up in the air as if it was a flagpole? Matt Duchesne is a veteran in this league. He's been around way too long, and he knows better than to have his stick up. It was an easy call to make, and the four-minute call was more than likely the right call right there. Ingram comes up with a save on Schmaltz, diving back to the post. Impressive save right here. Then comes up with another save on Galchenyuk. Boyd goes off the box. Two minutes for tripping. This is at almost the end of the four minutes. It would lead to a 156 power play for the Nashville Purs. Matt Duchesne would have three opportunities. He would take two one-timers and miss wide, and then he would take the wrist shot, which would be a decent scoring opportunity. Johansson, unfortunately, could not corral a hot rebound and put that puck into the net, or else the Nashville Purs would have scored right here. 10-24, Galchenyuk hits the post down low. Ingram is able to squeeze the loose puck in behind him before any more damage can be done, but immediately after that, on the face off 10-27, Gospierre at 14th goal of the season. It's a long shot off of the post through traffic, giving Arizona a 5-4 to four lead in the third period, and they are just absolutely out-competing the Nashville Purs in every opportunity. At one point, the broadcast even made a notation that the Arizona Coyotes seem to be playing for something more than the Nashville Predators. That's something I will never, ever, ever be able to understand. I don't think anybody will be able to convince me. So Duchesne comes up with a huge between-the-legs opportunity with the six-on-five opportunity, and it is stopped by Sateri and the National Purs would get a couple of their shots on goal, but everything would be turned aside, and we would hit the end of this game with the Arizona Coyotes winning their last game in that particular rank by a score of 5-4. to 5-4 to four sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it, Renegades? The National Predators would outshoot the Arizona Coyotes 33-27 in this game, but they would absolutely fall, and it would be abysmal. Blowing a four-goal lead against a last-place team on the last night of the season when, frankly, they were phoning it in, that's what you get when you only play seven minutes. Try that against the Colorado Avalanche in the first round of the playoffs, and you will find yourself swept in four games. I do believe that the Nashville Predators can rebound from this, put this behind them, and move forward and be competitive in the first round of the playoffs. But what we saw tonight, frankly, is one of the single worst performances in Nashville Predators franchise history. I know we talk a lot about recency bias and hyperbolic type language, but you've got to be kidding me when you have a 4 to nothing lead in the first period of a hockey game and you end up losing 5-4. to four. It was, frankly, pathetic. The Nashville Predators stopped competing after the first seven minutes of the game, and they left Connor Ingram in his opportunity to get a chance to try out for a playoff starting goaltending position. They left him hung out to dry tonight with that half-stepping effort in front of him. Throw the tape away because the regular season's over. There's nothing you can do about it now. Handpicking your opponent never seems to go the way you expect it to anyway. So for the Nashville Predators and all their bluster and wanting the Calgary Flames, maybe getting the Colorado Avalanche will actually end up being better for them. There wasn't really a great option, was there? You were going to get a division winner versus a wild card. You're going to have to go on the road. You're going to have to take care of your business. So for the Nashville Predators, the regular season comes to an end with them exceeding expectations, finishing in the playoffs, and that gives them an opportunity to continue playing hockey. A couple of career years, a couple of big-time performances by some big-time players, rebound years, and a whole lot of team toughness. This team's been a lot of fun to cover this year. It's been very interesting to watch them sort of regrow and rebrand and build a new identity from within while casting off some players that were very popular here in Nashville. 
We'll have some analysis coming up here in just a moment from the rest of the Renegades of Puck. That was the Rebirth Sports full game recap. Connor Ingram was 22 out of 27 in this game, and this was his opportunity to try out to be the starter for the National Purs in the first round of the Western Conference playoff while UC Soros is still out with a high ankle sprain. And for Connor Ingram, it's safe to say after that performance that he is going to be the backup. He looked flustered, he looked frustrated, and he did not look like the calm, cool, collected goaltender that we've seen in Milwaukee for the majority of the season. Now, he'll have, I'm sure, another opportunity to get out there because nobody is saying big save Dave Riddick is going to be the starting goaltender all the way through. The Colorado Avalanche could change who the goaltender is in a very quick way. But for Connor Ingram, tonight eliminates him from the possibility of starting game one of the first round series against the Colorado Avalanche. Mastradamus is also going to talk to me about that. And also Mastradamus is going to take the time to look back and reflect on the season that was for UC Saros before the injury. At one point in time, UC Saros was clearly a Vezina finalist. He slipped, the numbers dipped, and now he's out injured. Was he overworked this season by John Hines? I actually tend to think so being made to go out there and play in back-to-backs multiple times, not allowing the backup goaltender because you didn't have enough confidence in him to play more games. UC Saros now finds himself out for the first round of the playoffs at the very least. Mastradamus has some strong opinions. He's also going to go back and reflect on the season. If it's between the pipes, you know it's within his domain. You can find him on Twitter, Greek Goalie 35. He is the starting goaltender of the Renegades of Puck. He is the one and only Greg Mishopoulos. Thank you very much, Charlie. What a wild ride it has been for the Nashville Predators 2021-2022 season. They started the season losing four of their first five games. They end the season losing four of their final five games. But in between, it has been a crazy ride all the way down to a playoff berth, which not too many pundits had them going, myself included. It was supposed to be a rebuild, a competitive rebuild, as David Poyle put it before the season started. I was very skeptical about it based on how the team performed under John Hines when he first came on board. He finally had a full training camp with the team to try to implement his style of hockey. And here we are in the playoffs. But of course, I am here to talk about the goaltending situation throughout the season. I'll start with David Riddick, signed as a free agent, come on board, 29 years old. 6-3-4 and four in his decisions, 886 save percentage, 3.57 goals against average. Obviously, the save percentage and goals against average, not something to write home about. His record overall, out of 26 points potentially out of the decisions that were determined while he played, he got 16 out of those 26 points. So it's not all bad for him. The team played their asses off in front of David Riddick. Are you a little tighter defensively in front of your backup goaltender? Probably so. You, when you don't have UC Saros back there to cover up some of the mistakes in their own zone, they do tend to play a little bit tighter defensively and keep things out of the middle of the ice. Connor Ingram started the season on the roster thanks to David Riddick being on COVID protocol. He ended the season on the roster thanks to UC Saros' injury, of course. He will be a big player going forward, but as far as the season goes, one and two on the season for Connor Ingram, his first NHL experience. Good for him. He's been through a lot. We are all rooting for him to be a success, and in all likelihood, be UC Saros' backup in the coming years. But of course, the majority of my time is going to talk about UC Saros. 38-25-3 on the season, a 9-18 save percentage, 2.64 goals against average on the season. Goals against a little bit higher, especially how the team played down the stretch. However, UC Saros, 38 wins. If you think about this, if he doesn't get injured in that Calgary game, he finishes that game, that's a victory, that's 39 wins. He, in all likelihood, would have started one of these last two games and gotten a victory. That's 40 wins. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know this, but 40 wins for a goaltender in the NHL is incredibly difficult. And I'm talking about, if you're talking, say, Major League Baseball pitcher getting 25 victories in a season, incredibly rare to do. Some guys have done it, of course, a couple times, but even the best don't get there very often. Here is a long list of Hall of Fame goaltenders and how their numbers compare to getting 40 wins in a single season. Henrik Lundqvist, one of the best goaltenders ever with the New York Rangers, never had 40 wins in his illustrious career. Dominic Hasek, who I believe is still the best goaltender in NHL history, only reached that plateau once in his career. Patrick Waugh, one of the best ever without a doubt. Second all-time in victories. 
took him to 35 years old to get one season of 40 wins in his career. Tony Esposito never did it. Glenn Hall never did it. Grant Fuhr, all those teams with the Edmonton Oilers, with Gretzky, Messier, Glenn Anderson, all those guys, you would think that he had several seasons of 40 wins or more. He had just one. Chris Osgood, possibly a little bit overrated, but he played behind an incredible dynasty of a team in Detroit. Never got to 40 victories in his career. Pecorine, our own Pecorine, actually did it twice, uh, which tells you the caliber that Pecorine is and how much he is indeed a Hall of Fame goaltender. Back-to-back -back incredible seasons for UC Saros. If anybody thought he was just on a hot streak last year, he proved those doubters wrong from the get-go. He had an absolutely incredible season for the Nashville Predators. And again, still pretty young for a goaltender. Some of these guys hit their peak in their 30s. UC Saros still well away from that mark, and he's only going to get better. You can find him on Twitter, Great Goalie35. He is the one and only starting goaltender of the Renegades of Puck. And I sure do appreciate Moss jumping in the trenches with the Renegades of Puck. He is simply the best. Listen, Strong Style Fitness is a great partner of the Renegades of Puck. 150 workouts by a certified personal trainer on YouTube completely on demand. And since they are donation-based, that means they are free to each and every one of you renegades of puck your health and your happiness is more important than strong style fitness making a profit at this time so they have made all of those workouts completely available and free to you whether it's your first stretch or you're throwing iron like pro come on join strong style fitness in the trenches as they have done with the renegades of puck tracy is incredible you can find strong style fitness online of course on all social media facebook instagram and twitter and also strongstylefit.com i encourage each and every one of you to check out strong style fitness today new videos coming soon as the weather continues to warm we'll get the studio fired up and we'll start recording more videos for strong style fitness so again Really appreciate what they have done to help us out in partnership throughout this entire season. Record-breaking seasons for the Nashville Predators. We talked about it a little bit in the intro and going over the statistics. Romeosi with 96 points. Now as Nashville Predators single-season points franchise leader at 96 points. The goal record fell this year. Matt Duchesne, 43. Philip Forsberg, 42. So two players breaking the single-season franchise goal records just like it happened the last time the record was broken when it was Arvidsson and Forsberg. Now it is Duchesne and, of course, Forsberg. We've seen record-breaking seasons throughout the roster for the Nashville Predators. Janot broke the franchise record for hits in a season. It was actually an impressive group this year to see them come together and build a new identity. Did they perform to the level that everyone had hoped they would at each and every level and every step and every game? Absolutely not. They're still a team that is growing, and John Hines is still a head coach that is fairly young compared to many of the other retread head coaches around the NHL. So it was a fairly interesting season to watch the Nashville Predators perform above expectations and to have several players have these huge career years and have Matt Duchesne and Ryan Johansson have these big franchise bounce back seasons as far as stats go. And also to see the toughness throughout the lineup of this team, the number of fights, the number of fighting majors, the hits, and yes, the penalties were a problem at times, but playing physical, playing that style is always going to lead to a lot of penalties. So overall, it was a very enjoyable season to cover as an analyst and somebody who has been doing this for very, very many years. It was not the same old wash, rinse, repeat that we've seen in the last several years since the Peter Laviolette era. A change in personality, a change in attitude, and finishing above expectations. It was a lot of fun to cover. It was a lot of fun to watch. And now for the Nashville Predators, they can accomplish anything. They're just going to have to play as a focused group, impose their own will, and certainly, certainly not give up four goal leads at any point in time ever again. So it was an interesting season to cover, an interesting season to watch. And for the Nashville Predators now, they find themselves in the Western Conference playoff bracket as just one of eight teams in the West to make the playoffs. Let me tell you a little bit about the box score before we kick it over to Brian Baston from this last game of the season. Mikhail Granlin scores a goal. Ryan Johansson scores a goal. Colton Sissons and Ellie Tolvin. And great to see Tolvin back on the score sheet. I felt he gave up an opportunity to score a second goal in this game. Wish he would have cashed in on that just to show the coaching staff how much he wants to be out there. He 
he's played so good this season, even though the numbers might not have worked out in his favor. On the assist side of things in this game, Duchesne and Forsberg. Tomasino also in the assist. And on the defenseman, three defensemen recording assists in this game. Give it up to Jeremy Davies. Stick tap for him picking up an assist in this game, filling in for Matias Ekholm. Fabro gets an assist. Roman Yossi gets one more assist, one more point before the end of this season. For the Nashville Perth, time on ice, Matt Duchesne, 20.05, led the forwards, and Roman Yossi led the overall team in time on ice, 25.19. Connor Ingram, 22 out of 27, and takes the loss. Now, let's throw this over to the Renegade Analytics desk and talk to Brian Bass, and he's got the numbers you need to know, the charts you need to see, and he's going to go back and take a look at the Nashville Predators season that just finished up. Well, welcome to the final regular season trip to the Renegade's Analytics desk. What do you even say after an infuriating loss like that? Sure, Connor Ingram was playing in just his third NHL game ever, but what was supposed to be a dress rehearsal for players like Ingram, Ellie Tolvanen, Matt Luff, and Jeremy Davies was nothing short of an utter disaster. The surprising win over the Colorado Avalanche gave the Predators a leg up in securing the first wildcard spot and a playoff series against the Flames, but after Dallas defeated Anaheim tonight and the Preds couldn't muster up a single point that they needed, it's off to Denver to face the Colorado Avalanche. I said before the season that this team should consider itself successful if they get just get a playoff berth, but that was before the scores of broken records and career years by guys like Philip Forsberg, Matt Duchesne, and Roman Yossi. Much like tonight, the playoffs could leave a nasty, bitter taste in the mouth, mouths of Preds fans. But before we look ahead to the Avs, let's start with a special season review version of one big stat. However, since this is a review, let's look at a few important stats about this 2021-2022 uh, Nashville Predators team. First, as William Mace reported on the broadcast tonight, the Nashville Predators will finish this season with the best power play percentage in team history at 24.4% led by players like Roman Yossi and Matt Duchesne's career high in uh, power play goals, the Preds have been extremely deadly with the man advantage. However, that historic number is only good for a tie for fifth in the NHL this season, tied with Florida and just 0.4% higher than the Avalanche. Well, how did that play a power play do tonight? Well, they went 0 for 2. Can't have that, especially against an offensive powerhouse like the Avalanche. Second, the, phys the physicality of this team has been talked about often, and after 82 games, Nashville remains atop the league in the total number of hits, 2,470, as well as nearly 30 hits per 60 minutes. That lead uh, in hits is over 100 more than the next highest team, which is the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now, Nashville thrives when they can exert their will against opponents, and with things like extremely aggressive forechecking, uh, fights, obviously, to slow the game down. And leading the charge in that department has been the herd line, who unfortunately has gone flat, with Colton Sisson's opening score tonight the first in a couple of weeks for the unit. How did they look tonight? Again, unfortunately, they were out hit by the Coyotes, 43-28. to Next on the list is something I've talked about all season. We all remember Peter Laviolette and his turtling, that is, playing soft on defense when the team has a late lead. This season will still be the best Nashville has done in six seasons when leading after two periods with 31 wins, one loss, and one overtime loss. The sole regulation loss? You guessed it, that was tonight. However, this is incredibly encouraging that the team is headed in this direction overall, but how much of that game-saving ability was due to UC Staros? And speaking of Saros, or rather the lack thereof, the last big stat for the night is the performance of the backup goaltenders. Connor Ingram, tonight's starter, finished the season 1-1-1, one, 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 allowing 11 goals on an 87.9 save percentage. Last night's starter, the veteran big save Dave himself, David Riddick, finished at 6-3-4, allowing 49 goals at an 88.6 save percentage. In the 16 games played by the backups, the team is 7-4-5 and, and has a combined 88.7 save percentage. To compare that, UC Saros finishes the regular season with a 91.8 save percentage. So what do you take from tonight other than something to help you go to sleep not angry? The Predators are going to have to hit hard, score a ton to get leads, protect those leads, and give the backup goaltender some goal support. Not to mention, they're going to have to, you know, cut down on the penalties. With a guy like Nathan McKinnon on the other side, they can't afford to be on the penalty kill four or five times, but I've talked enough about that. Well, and if they don't do all those things we just talked about, well, you could probably expect more of what you saw tonight. I'll be back next time with a preview for the series against the Avs, so make sure you stick around as me and the rest of the Renegades will be with you every step of the way. Back to you, Charlie.
I'm on Twitter at Brian Bass, and you can check out his work on thefourcheck.com. He's got the charts you need to see and the numbers that you need to know. He is the one and only Brian Bass, and he runs the Renegade Analytics Desk, and I'm looking forward to Brian's one big stat and all the numbers he is going to bring for us coming up, previewing the Colorado Avalanche and the NHL playoffs at large. One more partner to tell you about, and that is Stripe Digital Solutions. The logo on the wall behind me, the logo on the T-shirt, the T-shirt itself, all of the merchandise, renegadesofpuck.com, my social media, and my brand building plan, all of that is being assisted by Stripe Digital Solutions in a world that is extremely complicated when you're trying to run a small business, all of the different hoops, all of the different steps you have to climb, you need some assistance. And Stripe Digital Solutions can be there to help you through every one of those steps and give you advice and help you tremendously. Believe me, Stripe Digital Solutions has been there with the Renegades of Puck every step of the way. When did this operation start to grow? When did it start to take off? When did we determine we could become an independent organization after working with Stripe Digital Solutions for a while? It became obvious we had the right infrastructure, we had the right people, we had the right partners, and we were ready to go. Your small business will definitely flourish if you work with Stripe Digital Solutions. So please reach out to Brandy at Stripe Digital Solutions today. You can do that by going to stripedigitalsolutions.com or Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and just reach out and start a conversation with Stripe Digital Solutions today. Truly, truly a great partner, great people, and everyone you hear about here on the show. They have stellar reputations and they have done incredible work with me here in the trenches. Now listen, let's go ahead and close this episode of Renegades of Puck TV out. Operation number 645 to wrap up yet another regular season for the Nashville Predators. This is the end of our 11th full-time season of covering Nashville Predators hockey. I have also covered hockey for the Nashville Predators and in other markets independently for many years beyond that. 26 and a half years now in the full-time entertainment and covering hockey industry and business. So I appreciate each and every one of you who have stuck with me for all of those years. We are continuing to build our extremely positive no half step in community. So I thank each and every one of you for jumping in the trenches with us this season long. Our first season on YouTube, but we have other outlets that are coming online very soon and we have many ways for you to consume the essence of no half step and in the modern age. There's no one way to put your show out or to put your entertainment entity out there into the world. You have got to diversify and you've got to put it out there across all platforms and that's exactly what we're getting better and better at doing all the time. So stick with the renegades of Puck moving forward. As the playoffs continue, we will expand our coverage outside the Nashville bubble and we will start covering more and more teams. You'll see where this is going very soon. Let me seriously close out the show here from the bunker and I just want to tell you this. Picking your opponent it's never really worked for the Nashville Predators. I remember a time when they had made the playoffs very often when everyone was clamoring for the Nashville Predators to get the San Jose Sharks in the first round when they would have home ice advantage for the first time ever. And the San Jose Sharks came in here and showed what a veteran team can do to an inexperienced team in the playoffs. They absolutely wore the Nashville Predators out. At other times, I've heard fans cry about what opponent they want to play only to get that opponent and it to go horribly wrong. The Nashville Predators talked an awful lot about wanting to play the Calgary Flames, but were the Calgary Flames really the best matchup for the Nashville Predators? The Calgary Flames are an incredible team, and no, they've not proven anything in the playoffs, but neither have the Nashville Predators, so I don't see how that was a good point to be making. The Colorado Avalanche also have failed to live up to expectation in recent times. For the Nashville Predators, there's absolutely no pressure on them. They didn't choose this opponent, and they won't get to choose going forward. They finished last in the bracket, and they will go on the road to start every single series of the Western Conference playoff bracket if they have the opportunity and the honor to play more than one round. The National Purge will take on the Colorado Avalanche, and it may surprise you to know this, that while the Colorado Avalanche, yes, finished as the number one seed in the Western Conference, and yes, finished 56-19-7 with 119 points and absolutely ran away with the Central Division, you may be kind of surprised to learn that the National Predators went 3-1 and one against the Colorado Avalanche this year and outscored the Colorado Avalanche 17-16. to 16. Yes, one of those games is when the Colorado Avalanche were depleted because of some COVID and illness situations, but... Every team is depleted with injury situations throughout the season. The National Prayers happen to catch the Colorado Avalanche on an advantageous night. 3-1, 17-16 in the scoring. And Big Save Dave 
has scored a victory over this Colorado Avalanche team already this season. They have the confidence. They have the tools. They have the ability. Now, it's up to the Nashville Predators to bring the no-half step into the rink and execute. So, for the Nashville Predators, Tuesday night, Game 1, Colorado Avalanche. For the Renegades of Puck, full playoff preview, Game 1 preview coming up on the next episode. I sure do appreciate each and every one of you jumping in the trenches with the Renegades of Puck. I am your host and your captain, Crazy Charlie Sonier. For Milo, our international correspondent, who's been giving me some notes throughout the show over on our Twitch feed. For Brian Baston, for Mastradamus, and of course, for Sean C. Smith, the ultimate one, K. Perk, and K. and Rachel K. Everybody will be back in the trenches here for the playoffs coming up here, starting with the next episode. Can't wait. It's the most glorious time of the year when it comes to this sport. Somebody's got to go. Four full rounds, best of seven, to hoist the most glorious trophy in all of sports. I can't wait to get started. Next episode, we preview game one. Stick taps, love, respect.